fun back there, I know. It'll be fun up here too. I'd like to get started in uh, two minutes. So if you can make your way up, it'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay, guys, let's come on in, please. Let's. are pulling into port. We're not quite there. We see it in the distance. 
and we're hoping that efficient infrastructure is going to get us right to where we need to go, offloaded, moved on, back home. But before we do that, um, you have worked probably harder than you thought you were going to. And um, I, I seriously hope that you have all found it to be worthwhile. It has been amazing to me to see the conversations which I have been seeing you have, both the ones we have helped to choreograph and just the constant din in between. So I think that has been fantastic. As you saw, and part of our process is trying to take big ideas, you push them down, you open them down, you push them down. And so we tried to reduce everything down to one A3 tile. And you can say, how is that possible? Well, you have actually done it brilliantly. And so what I'd like to do is share with you right now, the next sort of 10, 10 12 minutes, what you said. And so the first group I'm going to share with you is Unlocking Growth in Africa. And a group, a number of groups came together into sort of an idea that basically the big picture was we need good, strong leadership. If we're talking about unlocking growth, there's a hard side to it and a soft side to it. The hard side was we need infrastructure. We need a commitment to getting that infrastructure created. We need also a commitment for getting the soft infrastructure in place. And we're going to come back with the workforce to see there's some amazing parallels. And that soft infrastructure, with that commitment to training that you can also provide, we can provide, with that support from companies from abroad and at home. A couple of things which are quite interesting for me was the desire for us to help to lobby for that hard infrastructure to be invested in. It can be done. If the voice says, if we want truly this potential to be realized, we can do it, we can double that growth. We know that, we can double that trade. But we need that infrastructure, both on the front side and the back side, to be real. All right? Then another question that came up was about corruption. And corruption always has two sides to every equation. It's not just the one who has the hands out, but it's the one who hands the hands full. And that was also a point of conversation. Because what's the role that we have in this room with a hands being full or seeing or not seeing hands that are empty? There's also a proposal that at the very bottom one, which I thought was quite interesting, was to highlight those who are being successful, this creating an African Hall of Fame of best practice. You'll see almost every group thought that they needed to amplify the success stories, to really highlight those, to create that Hall of Fame that one can be proud of and say, we're a part of that, or ask themselves, how could we help be a part of that next time? The next one, Transport and Infrastructure Group. They came with essentially a wonderful little catchphrase that shipping moves the world. I really like that. Because as we opened up the very beginning, we in this room are the unseen force which allows free trade to even happen, that allows economies to exist. Without us, it wouldn't happen. And so this is quite interesting, thinking, what do we need? Well, we need to attract competent people, right? It is the number of people isn't the problem, it's the competent people. We need to raise awareness of the public end users. And I think, actually, this is the, this is the workforce one. This is not the infrastructure one. So you're going to, you're going to, uh, we're, we're just, this just says workforce on it, okay? That left-hand target is workforce. What? <laughs> we didn't say that. Chris, where'd that come from? So workforce, 
Shipping moves the world. We like that. Here we go. Shipping moves the world. We still do love it. And the problem wasn't that we don't get um, enough people. We've got uh, examples given in India. You might have 10,000 applicants for one position. In New York, you might get 10. Here in Denmark, maybe two or 300. And the question wasn't necessarily about the numbers, but the right people. A big question there for us was, on two parts of that, how we raise awareness in the marketplace outside of us, outside of our, um, our circles about what our industry is and as a career, what it can be. But I thought the other part as the action for us, which is really fantastic, was that we ask ourselves the question, and each one of us, because each one of us in this room are part of circles, other circles, what are you doing for the good of the industry as far as the workforce is concerned, right? To assess how we're doing, how you're doing in your different groups, right? Because you are part of many circles of like an onion. And what are we doing trying to understand what the participation is? An example that's brought up was Blue Denmark. The next one, we'll see what the next one is. They're beaverishly trying to fix them over there. This fantastic team. Need another slide up here, guys. Can we get another one up? It doesn't matter what it is at this point. I'll, I'll talk to it. <laughs> here we go. Supply chain efficiency is not future workforce. This is then, this is infrastructure. All right? Infrastructure needs, an in, we need an increased supply chain, a supply chain that has an increased efficiency. There was, an in, there was a, a, a real um, wish that this group would continue in its essence as a combination of a political private partnership between bodies who are there to regulate bodies who are there to do business together to create a body, be it a council, be it a think tank, be it something, an international council of stakeholders to prioritize some of the infrastructure challenges and solutions. And this came out again and again in the conversations was how wonderful it is to have everyone in one room to be able to talk about these things. And for these, for the, for the supply chain was to identify where the bottlenecks are and to make real recommendations as a group what could change over the next few years in a positive way. Not with a finger wagging, but these are things we can see could really help make things work. And so that was, I think, very, very important. And then again, as a group to decide where to go to lobby for some of those actions. Because we in this room have a voice. You now have a voice and could establish this group to do this. The next one is financing growth, and that is the one. For me, in listening to this, it was really quite interesting. The point was, well, well it's been financing. We've had growth. And money has been available, and the question was, how can we move our industry towards an investment-grade industry to understand how to match those who have expectations on the returns with the reality of our industry, and so that we don't get ourselves into mismatched trouble between expecting 30% returns in an industry where uh, on average, we're somewhere between 5 and 12% returns. And that was quite interesting for me, as coming from the outside, to hear that. And again, there was a desire to highlight some of the international best practices. Where is it really working well? Who's doing it? What should we be sharing with those who are t want to get into the industry? And the other part was, we need to make sure that, our, that others understand that our industry is like, uh, are like in, 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 um, an infrastructure, like a highway, right? We have many who invest in highways, right? It's not a bust and boom. It's not like a commodity. It's, this is an infrastructure which we all need. And finally was an idea that we need, and this came up in two different groups, a body which represents for all data for the, air, for the airlines. 
or for the transportation, the other, the other industry, that other one that moves people around and, and cargo around. That came up twice. A couple of groups thought about that. The next one, new technology and innovation. This had a really broad understanding of what it could be and where it could go, especially what was for me striking, and this might be very familiar to you, was you really strive to be number two. When it comes to innovating, nobody wants to go through that innovation door at the bottom first. It seems to be, have a pretty squeaky wheel there even locked, where innovation is either through, through regulation or through the industry as a whole is not really rewarded and, and said, this is great. And it's like, gosh, um, I'd love to do that if you can show me where it's already been done before. And so maybe one of the things that we can be doing is trying to understand how through cooperating in this super fragmented industry, which I've, I've heard many industries described as fragmented, but not sort of super ultra fragmented, how we can really truly have a common vision about where we're trying to get to so we know what innovations we, we collectively can, should be getting behind to try to encourage. Say, actually, let's perhaps fund a first failure. It's okay to fail, actually, if you, in some other industries. We don't want to fail because there's lots of life safety involved. And the same in the industry I'm typically with, with his buildings, it's not good if your building falls down. It's not good if a boat goes down. We know that. But we do also need to figure out how to reward innovation to make it efficient and profitable. Perhaps what we need to say is, the common vision is, from the forum, by 2030, we will have cut our emissions in half, and we will have doubled our capacity, and maybe that's a direction that the innovation is taking, and looking at how that could be. Because if we're going to double capacity, how do we do this? And this is a really challenging question for all of us. And I thought that was really fascinating. And again, it was an interest to have this group highlight best practice. Where are you seeing something that's innovative that's really quite phenomenal? And to celebrate it. And not to say, boy, I'm glad I didn't do that. But to say, how can we celebrate it? And the last one, I believe, if I'm not losing my count, was sustainable growth. And again, we all know we need to double trade, we need to reduce our impact by half, and ideally we do this in a way which allows us to be viable going enterprises. And we cannot lose money doing it. So we need to have, and they mentioned here the word smart, and smart, and depending on what world you're in, has very different meanings, but for here is really this idea of intelligent um, regulation, and perhaps what we could be doing is putting together a document which just, which just describes what are some really smart, smart principles for regulation. It's a holistic conversation with the regulators, with the shippers, all together, and let's say, let's kind of put our, we know what we've got, what is it that we wish we really had that would really be smart? We know the legal frameworks we have got to work with, but what would it be if we could rewrite some of those? I love the TLC, which was uh, tender loving care, right? And that was transparency. Peter, what is it? Transparency, longevity, longevity and, and, consistency. and what? Consistency. And consistency. Transparency, longevity, and consistency in order for us to be able to truly meet these goals. The other suggestion that came forward was to develop a paper on technology acceleration. Now, these two we put together because it also has to do with the innovation and new technology, but what if we could really put together so, up some papers which would include the financing and funding ideas, how you really could actually make some of these ideas real. And again, I come back to again and again and again what came across all of the groups was the power of your voices together from the different sides, different angles, and amplifying together our challenges, but also these solutions in a collaborative way, and really celebrating those best practices, to dig a little bit, to look within, but also outside, because we do not work in isolation. 
the world is no longer a place where you can, or any of us can just put our heads in the sand. We, we have to walk with our heads up. And by definition, whether we like it or not, there are more smarter people outside of this room than in it. With all due respect to all of us, all of you, if you add up the world, there are more smarter people outside than in. So let's take advantage of them and bring that intelligence, that innovative power and the solutions into our world as well. So that was a summary, uh, very brief, and I apologize to any of the session leaders if I butchered it. I really have tried very hard in listening. They've worked so hard, and you will receive a full reporting on all of this. Right? I've, I've, um, I had three and a half minutes to try to summarize what you spent hours on, and I'm sure all of you can appreciate the um, thankless task of trying to summarize that into three and a half minutes. So I would like to say, you should give yourselves a really great round of applause. You did a brilliant job, and uh, look forward to the next steps. So, we have one, two, three, four, five more things, which I'm really excited about, actually. We have a panel now. Uh, we have four individuals who are quite quite impressive, and I think between them, they have at least a century of, 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 and more of experience in the maritime industry. But the first one is not necessarily a mariner. He was a successful businessman. Uh, he became a servant to his nation between 94 and 98, the, one of the youngest presidents ever to be elected in Central America and pioneered after his presidency the link between sustainable development and technology, leading the United Nations first ICT task force um, in 1999, became the first CEO of the World Economic Forum where he really um, encouraged, I'll say, uh, the, the Davos Institution to embrace non-governmental organizations as a powerful force such as this body here is a NGO type, and then also joined the Carbon War Room in 2009 and is currently serving as its president. The Carbon War Room, for those who don't know, is, has a mission to ex adopt business solutions to help uh, reduce carbon emissions and still make money at it, which is fantastic. So, Jose Maria Figueres, if I could invite you to the stage, please. Um, our second guest, uh, Ebsen Polsen, and I, I apologize if I've butchered the name. Um, I'm I, I have some <laughs> lamps by uh, someone named Polsen, which uh, are quite beautiful, actually. I'm not sure if it's the same, fa same family. No, maybe not. I don't know. Okay, well, it's good, I figure. Um, chairman of Avra Asia P um, Party Limited, a commodity and trading and shipping business established in Singapore in 2010. He's been in the maritime industry for over 40 years, management positions all over, all over the world, Hong Kong, London, Copenhagen, and now in Singapore. He has been a very strong supporter of the forum since its inception. Um, he's been promoting the events, and many of you probably had your arm twisted by him to, to come here, but we're absolutely delighted you have. So, Mr. Poulsen, if I could invite you to the stage, that would be wonderful, thank you. Number three, Andreas Solman Pau. He's been the chief executor of the, I want to keep wanting to say BMW, but it's not quite BMW, it's BWM, the BW Maritime <laughs> and chairman of BWLPG. Um, when reading through his resume and Googling him, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if he sleeps. Reading all the things he's active in, uh, including the Sports Council and the Symphony Orchestra Council in Singapore, uh, on a couple of boards, on a bank building we engineered quite a long time ago. Um, and he has also, as you heard, for those who attended his fireside chat, a member of a shipping family, that, and that's quite a, really quite wonderful to have heard his, I wish I could have heard his fireside chat, look forward to getting a download on that, and has uh, very close ties to Denmark and was um, the first one to sign up to support the forum, so we'd like to recognize that, and please, if you wouldn't mind taking the stage, Andreas. And 
Thank you, sir. Last but not least, Henrik Madsen. He um, is very close to my heart because I also had a uh, degree in civil and structural engineering long time ago. I'm sure for both of us, we haven't used that in a long time. <laughs> um, but he was also a professor of structural mechanics. He's been, he's headed all of DNV's major businesses and the research division. Also lived in Asia and well as here. Um, was appointed the CEO in 2006, especially looking after strategy. And um, he was awarded in 2014, just a um, couple of months ago, in April, a few months ago, the coveted Sea Trade Lifetime Achievement Award, which for many of you, that will have quite a lot of meaning. Um, he's also a member of the World Business Council of Sustainable Design, which I think is really fantastic, and I look forward to hearing you and welcoming you to the stage at the moment. Thank you so much. So gentlemen, thank you for being here. And I will invite you first to share some thoughts on what you have um, heard, what you've seen of the past few days, um, and or whatever you feel like talking about first. And then I'm gonna dig into you afterwards. <laughs> so, um, Mr. President. Yeah. That was a long time ago. I know it was. <laughs> um, Friends, thank you so much. Uh, let me start off by saying that I'm delighted to be in the uh, country of my grandfather and my grandmother. My grandfather, uh, Fafa, which I should have called Mofa, but saying Fafa was much easier. Fafa and Momwa, instead of getting confused with Famwa or Momwa and the rest. <laughs> uh, Fafa lived with us to the tender age of 105. Wow. And he had a beautiful definition for youth. He said, one is young while one has more illusions than remembrances. So he lived 105 and he passed away young, full of illusions. It's a pleasure to be back in Denmark. And I want to thank you and the organizers of this event because it certainly does not fall by any measure of standards in the normal basket of events that we all attend on a more than regular basis. It seems that, sometimes it seems that between attending events and answering emails, there's no more any time for work. But in any case, uh, it's been fantastic uh, to be able to participate in the working groups, to evolve thoughts around them, and to come up with a very succinct and clear recommendations that we have here today. It seems to me, if I may say so as a observer of the industry, uh, over the two days, what I take back is that we are actually looking here at what I would call a V-shape. A V-shape. On the one side are some elements of decline that I would mention. First. The entire industry has been battered, as one could expect, by the global economic situation as of 2008 and 2009. And there are many different manifestations of that. Secondly, while that was coming down the pike, increased regulation has come to the forefront of the industry in many ways such that some components of the industry does not feel adequately represented in the formulation of that regulation. Thirdly, we have an uneven playing field because regulations are not enforced with the same vigor across the board, and therefore it is very hard to compete in a challenging world if you want to abide with regulation while others are not. And fourthly, as if that was not enough on the downside, what I see is a tremendously fractured industry amongst a group that has a virtual monopoly on shipping on the oceans. What better position to be in if you look at it from that perspective? Mm. So 
coming down on this side, these four elements, at the base to begin constructing in the other direction, I recall what the Minister of Singapore said yesterday. This industry is going to double by 2030. No matter what happens out there, with very modest economic growth and the world will grow, you are going to double by 2030. Now, how many industries in the world can say that? Hmm. Not too many that I'm aware of. Secondly, from two of your slides here, I saw something which, in my book, would enable the shipping industry, the global shipping industry, to come out at the forefront of global events and positioning itself as a leader in the transformations that the world will have to go through. So shipping moves the world forward and doubling business, halving emissions in a profitable way. That would be my campaign slogan <laughs> if I was back in 1994. That's a good one. I think that's a winner because there's more consciousness that that is a way that we want to go as a world. And why be at the receiving end if we can jump forward faster and better and lead with what we can do? And derived from then, then, there are all different types of possibilities that have been very clearly staked out here that put us on the opposite direction of winning and moving upwards. Uh, there are elements that have to do with culture. I've seen here ideas, and I'm finishing up in 30 seconds, Thank you. of co-creating a think tank. Some called it the IADA. Some called it an international council. But it makes absolute sense to be able to respect the different organizations that you have had in the past or mold them in a different way and come up with something that represents global shipping as a world entity. Technology co-creating regulation. We could go on and on. There are many opportunities here on the upside that I hope we'll be able to talk about later. Thank you. I hope so again too. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Polson, you're next in line. Thank you very much. And mm -hmm. um, thank you very much to the Danish Shipowners Association and to the hardworking secretariat of this event for, um, I think we can all agree, pulling it off or nearly pulling it off within an hour or two. And um, I think when this all started, it was, um, it was uh, believed to be an experiment that might or might not work. And um, I'm just glad that those involved had the boldness and the vision to stick with it and um, carry on with it, because I think the result is here for all to see. And I hope that in 12 months' time, we will see some really concrete results as a, as a result of our efforts today. I think um, I'm very flattered to be asked to join this panel because actually I don't really know why I was asked, uh, <laughs> except for the fact that uh, I'm nearly 50 years of the 100 years, so I suppose that's why. That's but anyway, right um, I, I think that there, there are many, many things that one could, could comment on and take away, but to me, the, the biggest single thing based on my um, many years in shipping is the fact that we have an image problem that people have talked about endlessly for years and years and years and years. And to this day, the oil-covered bird uh, that we see on the television screens carry far more weight than all the tremendous work done by the industry uh, over the years to improve itself, because this doesn't sell papers and is not very interesting. But nonetheless, I spoke at, a, at an OECD international transport forum uh, on behalf of the International Chamber of Shipping, of which I'm one of four vice chairmen, in June, um, and, I, and I addressed some transport ministers, no minutes, no press, so we could all speak openly. And I was astonished at the, if I can call it, loss of translation, lost in translation. We just, they were amazed at some of the things I told them, and I was mm. frankly amazed at some of the things they told me. Mm. And it underlined to me that we just are not even speaking the same language. So the initiatives um, that of which we have many today, which is coordination, cooperation, unified message, this is what we should be really focusing on because we have a great story to tell, but we're just not very good at telling it. Um, I mean, I held up a slide um, showing 
uh, oil spillage um, in 1970 to compared to today, and, and I could tell by the reaction of these ministers that they were absolutely astonished. Mm. And so we should be very proud of this, not that we are 100% perfect, but the progress made is tremendous, and we need to be able to articulate this better, and we need to do that in a unified way. We have International Chamber of Shipping, which is close to my own heart, which I think is a very good organization. We have Intertanko here, represented by the chairman. We have uh, BIMCO, represented here, Intercargo, etc. We have the organizations. We just need to coordinate much better, and we need to put our hands in our pockets and fund these organizations properly so that we are not nickel and diming for an airfare here there for people to join um, an important event. I think we need just to, to think a bit bigger in this regard. On the question of cooperation, um, I have to plug um, my own hometown, which is Singapore, my own country, because there I think the level of cooperation that we, that we take for granted is one that perhaps others could aspire to, because it's simply a natural uh, course of events that mm. uh, our flag state, the MPA, consults our, um, our owners association, our shipping association, called Singapore Shipping Association, on many issues. We have a quarterly dinner with an, with an agenda. Uh, we don't agree on everything by any means, and if we don't agree, we uh, try and understand why we don't and what we can do perhaps to solve it. But it's done in an open, uh, and uh, I hate to use the word transparent because it's been very much used already, but it is in an open and transparent manner that, that uh, encourages us in the industry to, to try and understand the government's point of view and they understanding ours for mutual benefit. And this, is, this model is one that I would encourage all owners associations and governments to adopt because by speaking frankly and openly and honestly, um, I think things can be made better. So... Um, okay, one more. That's it, I think, for me. Okay. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, you stopped me in full flow, but I... I no, no, I, I didn't I mean to stop you in no, full I could flow. I could definitely go on, but I think this is the... Uh, there are many other things that, we, that we've talked about, and I, I personally learned a lot, um, and, I, and I, um, I... Yeah, I think well, I'm, I, I'm done. I, I love... I just, just to strive to be the best we can be through understanding and trusting that the conversation will enhance rather than degrade. It's just sound like in Singapore what you're able to do which sounds important and what this was about was being able to have that kind of conversation as well. I think that's... So, um, Andreas, could you share a few thoughts? Uh, there are a lot of conferences in the maritime industry and I only go to a few but I tend to hear when we talk about challenges a lot of the same themes coming up uh, and you know, we started yesterday talking about challenges. Well, the economics of the business are very poor because we are oversupplied and fragmented. We have environmental pressures to add to that. Regulation is not working well enough. The supply of talent is not enough. And I found myself thinking, you know, is this a bit of a sense of deja vu have we been here before? Have we talked about these topics before? And is this going to be any different? And I'm pleased to say I thought this was very different uh, in, a positive <laughs> in a positive way. Um, and I really congratulate the organizers. I mean, just to, to point out some of the things that I think were different. First of all, there were some very good insights from experts who talked also about the upsides and the opportunities. So, you know, this reference to doubling of um, trade, um, but also how much trade can unlock affluence. And even diving sort of deeply into, in some of the conversations, into this topical debate of inequality and where, you know, where inequality is worst and, and where it's happening. And actually one of the conclusions um, uh, was that, uh, you know, we have a rising middle class and we have rising affluence around the world. There are definitely pockets which are suffering. Um, but on the whole, the world is becoming more affluent and we are a big part in that. Uh, trade, shipping is contributing to a better 
a better world. So, you know, these optimistic notes, I think we have to remind ourselves from time to time because we can focus on the negatives. The second thing that I thought was different is that it's very difficult to stimulate the creative process, creative thinking, creative solution making. And I think that what you know, one needs to do is to focus in on a few topics, then you need, need to listen to this expert input to get the juices flowing, then you need to apply them against your own experience, then you need to talk about it in a group, you need to then summarize it nicely. All these elements were here over these two days. If you just sit in a group and talk all the time without any inputs, that's problematic. Uh, if you just sit and listen to experts, that's problematic. And this had a nice flow. Uh, so again, congratulations to the organizers for doing that. The other thing that I thought was different and quite amazing was being able to sum up uh, all these discussions, some coherent, some less coherent, and sort of driving them into these wonderful summaries. I mean, if we have an international council, the first members should be the, the guys drawing <laughs> these pictures. <laughs> You know, if we want to cut through the, the haze of all these issues and challenges and summarize it beautifully into a mind, uh, mind map, then these guys really have, have done very well. So um, that, that was something special. Um, even if we don't feel that we've perfectly articulated all the solutions, I think that we've got this creative process going. And we also have some clear themes that have emerged. And I'm not going to... Uh, go into detail on, on what's already been said. But I think if I was to pick out one, it is that we seem to be getting worse at consensus building. And I don't know why that is, whether it's information overload, whether it's because we've become distracted, whether some of us have maybe given up on these uh, institutions that are supposed to drive a consensus. But I think that's a feeling, and it's probably not unique to our industry. We talked a lot, uh, or heard a lot about the sort of stalling of world and regional trade agreements. Um, I think globally and within our industry, we're not uh, doing that well on consensus building. And that's such an important element to defining a clear purpose and then getting action towards making these things happen. Um, I really like some of these ideas around um, whether it's international council or working with the existing institutions to drive things better, um, interaction between government and industry. I think there's a whole field here that we need to see some action on, uh, small wins as well as some big progress. And my last point is, you know, if we're going to see consensus building, then there can be far worse places to start than with a forum like this on an annual basis. So thank you and congratulations again. Great. <clears throat>
we need a good global governance. This may be one of the most globalized industries, and without a good, effective global governance, it would be very difficult for us to succeed. We have IMO, and uh, we need others uh, also to set good global standards that we can all be behind, and also to create this uh, level playing field. Uh, what I, you can say with this, all these short-term issues, what I would like to see more of is that we set some long-term ambitions for the industry. And we heard from Espen about oil spills. Very few people, Espen is one of the exceptions, know that we have reduced oil spills from accidents from 300,000 tons per year in the early 90s to 5,000 tons. It's a fantastic story. Mm -hmm. You can say, how did it happen? It was, uh, it was uh, external pressure, it was regulations, but it, it was, there were many things that came together to achieve that. Also, when it comes on recycling, yes, there are many things that can be done better, but 90% of all material is recycled. There are not so many industries who can say that. So, but there are other areas where I believe we should set ambitious targets. One, I mentioned safety. Why should it be much more dangerous to be on board a ship, either as a crew member or as a, as a passenger, than to be on a, on a plant on shore? Uh, we will be forced to put a target on our emissions. I think the local pollution in terms of NOx and SOx may be handled by present regulations and technology that will eventually be implemented. But on CO2, we will have, there will be a pressure on CO2, so whether it's half in 2030 or whatever it is, but to put some ambitious target on, on uh, CO2 emissions and then show pathways to achieve that. And then, of course, we have to continue to be competitive so also if we could, if we could communicate to the, to, to the users of our services how we will maintain our competitiveness so that we don't, at least in Europe where you can see that there may be other modes of transport that you put more onto ships and less onto other, other uh, forms of transport. Um, so uh, Andreas talks about problems and risks and so on and, and how to create opportunities. I'm uh, sort of an optimist, so I, I always had the belief that the, the difference between an opportunity and a problem or a risk only depends on when you discover it. So if you discover it early enough, you can make it into an opportunity. So that if we would be much more systematic in trying to turn some of the risks into opportunities, where you can also make good financial gains, I think that's something that the world would benefit from. And when it comes to technology, I'm sure we'll see much more technology development in the next 10 years than we've seen in the past 50 years. We've talked a lot here about fuels, about energy efficiency. The revolution from ICT is something that I think none of us can, can dream of, what that will mean in terms of automa automation, in terms of safety, maybe in terms of even aut autonomous systems. It is just going so fast that, uh, that uh, it will be difficult for us to, to follow, but the opportunities will be enormous. Of course, that will also create new risks that we need to, to manage, but I think on that side, the opportunities will far outweigh, outweigh the risks. So I will stop with that. Thank you. Thank you. That's fantastic. That's good, man. Thank you so much. <coughs> I really like the way you said the difference between, you know, I'll say catastrophe, whatever, it, and that is when you see the opportunity is, can you say it again? You no, I say the, the difference between an opportunity and the risk or when problem you see it. is only depends on when you see it. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. what are the things we're seeing right now today? Let me ask each one of you that we need to keep in mind when we're looking forward for the next year. What are some of those little little tidbits right now that you heard that you think we need to identify? I'm going to start, Andreas. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> I think carbon um, pressure is coming and it's coming fast and we need to get ahead of it because if we are sitting here in five years without having done anything on mitigation then we're going to be in this usual disarray of trying to deal with all these proposals cap and trade this that the other rather than us taking the lead and saying here is a framework you know my, my kind of aspiration is we become a role model for other industries in terms of setting direction, um, coming up with frameworks that work for us. So my small analogy is, you know, put in place a carbon tax, charge $10 a ton next year, we pay six, $700 a ton for fuel, it's not going to hurt us that much. 
signal the direction that it's going to go, say it's going to be $100 in 10 years, so that we all have time to adjust, we know what the price is going to be, we can adjust our investments and so on according to a known price, not a fluctuating one. Then we'll have whatever it is, $10, $20 billion in a fund by the end of 10 years. Let's not put it into a black hole somewhere, let's channel it back into the industry. Um, I can think of lots of good uses in the environmental sphere, one of them is green scrapping. And lo and, lo and behold, we've solved overcapacity, We've solved problems with scrapping in Bangladesh and India, and we have started to make a move on carbon, and we've done it in a measured, practical, practical way, rather than suddenly being on the back so, foot. So we like those win-win-win situations. So there's one, which is the carbon. Jose Maria, this is a part of your... I mean, I, would you I would agree with that. If one, takes the, uh, if one aggregates the carbon emissions of the 50 or 60,000 ships that you own, out there in the world, they would be the equivalent of emissions of a nation with an economic output between Japan and Germany. So you would be the sixth largest nation. Now obviously that type of a thing for an industry in a world which is going in that direction, Andreas, as you point out, is not going to kind of slide under the radar screen. I think there's a tremendous opportunity to get ahead of that, out lead with very clear long-term measures that can enlighten regulation and work together as an industry with regulators, with the IMO, in terms of achieving those targets over a trajectory that can be almost self-financed, or I would take the almost away, self-financed with the savings. If you look okay. at the potential of energy savings, there's a tremendous amount there that can be harnessed. That's great. So we've got one category, which would be the carbon. Ibsen, do you have another one? We see an opportunity, if we see it now, we could actually, as a group, do something pretty spectacular? Um, well, I, I, think, um, I think the manpower issue is, uh, is really a big one, and uh, w it's been well addressed at this conference, but it, it needs to. It needs a lot of attention because uh, wringing one's hands and pinching uh, uh, crew yeah, from other yeah, owners yeah. is just not a long-term um, solution. It, it just, uh, it, you know, it needs a concerted effort um, across the board. And various nations have various uh, initiatives underway. Um, we certainly do in, in Singapore, and I know here in Denmark as well. But but a lot more needs to be okay. needs to be done. On that, that sounds like two good ones. We've got carbon pressure, workforce pressure. Do you have one? I'd like to come back to ICT and the opportunities when we get a broadband on board the ships. We can collect so much more data from the ships. We can have decision support onshore. Um, we can uh, automate, have a more automation. But also for the people on board the ship, the world, it, it creates a lot of, of welfare for the seafarers when they are, are almost home any time they want to be. So I think the opportunities with the really the broadband and what happens on ICT, on sensor technology, on big data, whatever we call it, is enormous. That's good. So big ship, big data. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, couldn't help that one. Okay. Um, here we are at the end. You are almost our, our last. You, you get to truly almost have the last word, a last word. Um, in one sentence, said, I wish we would do something. What would it be? One thing you could wish for. If you were prince for a day, king for a day, chairman or president for a day, I wish we would, in the form, I wish we would blank, what would it be? Andreas? Become a role model for other industries on how we shape change. Beautiful. Become a role model for other industries, how we shape change. Speak with a unified voice and promote the image of our great industry. Fantastic. Speak with one unified voice to promote our beautiful industry. Jose Maria? To walk the talk, <laughs> sum up your recommendations, which are darn good, excuse my French, <laughs> and move on them so that you can come back to actionable progress next year. And last but not least, I give you the hard one. Thank you. you. No, I wish that we can really collaborate together to make shipping a part of a sustainable future. Fantastic. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I tell you, I think if we have those four wishes satisfied, we'll be pretty, I'll be pretty happy. Uh, do you think those are four things which might be worth working towards? Can anybody say no? <laughs> uh, you can maybe tell me afterwards, but that's all right. Um, we have some closing remarks from a very um, important gentleman. So I think it's a pleasure to be able to welcome to the stage in, in just a second. The IMO, as you know, is the United Nations Special Agency with responsibility for the safety and security of shipping and the prevention of pollution around the world by ships. It is a global industry, and any issues that arise on the seas require a global consciousness and a global action, which is exactly what the IMO facilitates. Mr. Sekimitsu was elected to the Secretary General of the IMO in June of 2011 after having been with the organization since 1989. He's been in the Ministry of Transportation and has truly been a great friend to the maritime industry through his passion. And in chatting to him a little bit earlier today, I was talking to him about some of his other parts of his life, but he's an avid golfer. And I had to ask him his handicap, even though I'm not really a player. And he goes, well, I can tell you what it used to be. <laughs> but because I'm so busy now, I'm not quite sure what it is today. And I'm sure we can all have great sympathy with that sentiment of we once had a little bit more time than we might have had today to do the things in our other parts of our lives. So, sir, if I can invite you to the stage. Shall I hear? Yeah, yeah. Right. That's not all right. We're gonna s you can pick yellow and I'll be in Okay. Orange. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> sort of the, all the, the fruit colors. So, um, first question. You weren't here yesterday afternoon. Right. Yeah, so, you, yesterday you afternoon, I... So, I want to know where you were. I tried to get out of the schoolroom and the classroom, but I, I enjoyed uh, very much uh, on board uh, the... Uh, DFSF, am I right? Uh, the uh, n name of the company. I may be wrong. <laughs> and uh, that was a car ferry uh, connecting from uh, Copenhagen to uh, Oslo, as far as I understand. The main purpose was uh, to observe uh, Scrubber, and that was a really good one. But uh, what I was not really expecting was uh, within the uh, engine room, we are really impressed uh, with the uh, really impact of the teamwork over uh, six years. As far as I understand, uh, they managed to reduce uh, emission and improve the efficiency and clearly reduce the spent of uh, fuel oil by more than uh, 20% over the six uh, years. Uh, this is exi existing vessel, how they managed to do that. This is the teamwork and the leadership of the chief engineer, and everybody provided a good idea, and uh, they implemented it. Uh, this is determination from the top of the company yeah. to implement, yeah. and I have observed the full list of probably 60, 70 lines accumulated over the uh, six uh, years. An impact was uh, clearly more than 20% reduction. Which is a, which this is, is a significant, and uh, you are talking about uh, potential, the potential of growth. Yeah. Well, this is clearly potential of shipping industry yeah. to reduce uh, CO2 emission. And Andreas mentioned about a model for other industry. I'm sure shipping industry will become a really good model for other industry to follow in dealing with uh, the carbon. That'd be fantastic. So that see. was the reason why well, I was not excused. there. Okay, you're excused then for doing that, especially to see how you can improve the efficiency of a existing motor so well, or existing engine. Um, you, when you were here yesterday morning, right? you were with the ministers and attended the minister session. 
Were there some things you could share with us, some highlights from that session that, um, in, in our final session, just to come back to where we started? Certainly, uh, that I need to take a look at my memo. Uh, we had a uh, really good conversation, interaction, and uh, within the short period of time, we touched upon various things, uh, the potential growth and a potential reduction of uh, CO2 emission. Uh, but uh, the, we talked about the trade system, free trade, yep. and the free access to uh, shipping industry. This is absolutely important for the future. Yep. So we need to ensure free trade and a current system. And in my view, that is not only a system to ensure free trade, but a current system of governance. That should be obviously from I IMO. But uh, I was uh, this uh, afternoon a bit disappointed that when I look at the old panels, uh, I couldn't see uh, the big IMO, a shining IMO in the panel, but a very small IMO was incorporated <laughs> there. <laughs> and if that is a reflection of uh, your uh, you know, understanding of uh, governance, I must say I was, I was a little bit uh, disappointed, but I'm sure that was not your intention. And, uh, but that is part of uh, how to report, the drawing the, and also providing a good uh, the key uh, information. But uh, I understand you need to also take a lesson. Uh, the well, we'll, IMO. We'll make, sure, we'll make sure that the IMO gets a. You can pick your color that you like to have it highlighted for you. Then we can make sure that it's in there. Yeah. Maybe. Well, I, I don't need to be highlighted, but uh, the IMO is a really <laughs> the global organization. Yeah. And in my view, IMO is a really shining star to ensure uh, the so far the shipping industry. And I'm sure we will continue to work towards that direction. Uh, the minister has discussed the importance of cooperation and uh, communication. And also, uh, technology is a key. Technology is a driver to explore the future yeah. of this great industry. And also, uh, we talked about uh, and how to avoid intervention by the political people, particularly from the geopolitical uh, element. Uh, you may recall the tr uh, yesterday's uh, panel discussion and uh, some concern about the uh, impact of geopolitics. Yeah. But uh, we, we, we should avoid that yeah. intervention, but I'm sure we can do that. Yeah. So avoid political intervention is very important. But at the same time, we recognize in order to ensure a sustainable system, we need backing from political people. Politician yeah. needs to understand the value of international shipping. Yeah. So we need that. But for politicians, they cannot just simply support us. They need to be supported by their constituencies and the general public. So rather than asking politicians to support us, the my take is we go for general public yeah. and impress the importance of international shipping, then if general public really understand the value, I'm sure political people, politicians will take that element. So yeah. that was an uh, element we discussed. And we agreed generally, the shipping is really essential for sustainable development. And uh, shipping has tremendous potential. So those are, uh, in a nutshell, uh, we discussed. Oh, that's fantastic. I, um especially brings to mind for me, someone told me once, uh, it's very rare for a politician to create a parade, but they're always very welcome to stand in front of one. <laughs> so perhaps what we need to do with that is to create that parade of the constituents, as you've described, who value and can express the value of the industry. Absolutely. I think that we need to uh, employ everybody's you know, hands. Uh, to take on board everybody's uh, support. We should go out from uh, shipping industry. We should speak to the general public yeah. and highlight the importance. Uh, probably I may touch upon at the later stage. Yeah. 
So you, you were asked very specifically um, to think about what, what your vision might be for us. And that was one of the things we asked the ministers as well. Some of them touched on that, some of them didn't. But part of what we've been working here for the past couple of days is also mm. about what our vision is. What would, could you share with us some of your thoughts on what the vision is for us? Well, well, certainly uh, I can talk about my vision, but I cannot talk about uh, your visions. And we want to hear from you. Uh, if I speak about um, some part of my vision, uh, the first one is growth. Yes. And you mentioned the double in 2030. Uh, maybe a little bit uh, ambitious, but if you take a look at the history of uh, world trade, you know, every 40 years, Seaborn trade has been quadrupled. Every 20 years, the trade and the capacity of the ship has been doubled. Hmm. So therefore, if we continue that trend, and then the year 2030, it is, uh, let's say, 15 years ahead, not be probably double, but uh, at least 70%. Uh, 70% or 100% doesn't matter the shipping industry needs to support global trade. So therefore, the industry will continue to grow, generally speaking. And then the amount of uh, uh, fleet, if the seaborne trade will be doubled, and obviously the number of the vessel and the capacity needs to be doubled. Uh, this is an element which uh, we need to really think about. Uh, the current uh, shipping industry is in a state of uh, adjustment after the big crisis. Yeah. And I, I'm sure that adjustment period may uh, remain for a while. If you take a look at the past experience, uh, 1970s, 1980s, and the 1973 first oil crisis, 78 second oil crisis. In order to absorb that huge overcapacity, the industry took uh, nearly uh, 10 years, more than 10 years. The probably this time, the shipping industry needs to take uh, the same period of uh, uh, you know, very difficult time. Uh, the overcapacity should be absorbed. So that is a very important element. So therefore, uh, the slow steaming, optimizing speed will continue. But this round of adjustment period is different from the previous one, some 40 years ago because we have included and uh, taken into account carbon pressure. Yeah. And MEPC, for example, adopted MAPOL Convention to apply AEDI. We will reduce emission from the new vessel. So that is a new element. And uh, from the, uh, yesterday's my experience, even the existing vessel is making progress. Yeah. So not only uh, absorbing the overcapacity, the carbon pressure uh, needs, to, uh, needs to compress the amount of emission is another element. So therefore, I think the, if world trade will increase, let's say f by the 70%, the fleet may go beyond that yeah. because slow steam may, may mean that you need to have a more fleet. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the, one of your panel, I think, indicated that if fleet will be doubled, and then impact or emission will be just half of it, so therefore 50%, I think that is accurate. It is very simple mathematical calculation. If fleet will grow by 100%, and we apply the measures of EDI and the energy efficiency, the clearly it's in fact, we will ensure the emission will be half of that growth. This is a significant, uh, I think, potential to yeah. contribute the current issue of greenhouse gas. And I think this needs to be really highlighted. Yeah. And uh, last week, I touched upon very good news. IMO uh, is going to release a 2014 greenhouse gas study. And uh, I was really pleased to know that. And the 2007 study, the contribution from uh, shipping industry to the global total uh, CO2 emission, that was 2.7%. Uh, 
Uh, now, if you take a look at that report, the year 2012, the 2.7 has, re reduced, has been reduced to 2.2% of the global total. And this is a significant reduction, more than 20%. And the reason is obviously not regulation, but a slow steaming uh, due to overcapacity. But nevertheless, I'm sure this trend will continue. Yeah. And by the year 2030, and I'm pretty sure that a contribution from shipping industry to the global carbon emission is below 2%. Yeah. I think that should be really highlighted Maybe. in our effort. I think, that again, the IMO and uh, international shipping is a good model for other industries. So maybe that's maybe. There we go. Whoa. There are a few folks here who agree with it. Maybe that's one of the targets that uh, we could agree on as a group to, um, to think about it. I want to ask you a, very, a, a completely different question, um, which um, you have been in the industry for, for quite a few years. As I said, you've been a, a great friend to the industry. What would you say has been the greatest change that you would observe from, say, from 1989 when you were stepping in um, till 2014. The world changes around us constantly. And um, what would you say would be one of the bigger changes you've seen? Uh, I have been working for IMO from uh, 1989 as a secretariat. Yeah. But I worked for international shipping uh, as a member of Japanese government from uh, uh, 1950, for, uh, no, 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 19, no, 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 I have been observing all the development. Uh, the one thing I think uh, really remarkable thing is not only for those uh, 40 years, but a full life of IMOs over a half a century, 1960, 17, 18, 19, and nowadays. The remarkable difference is, uh, let's say, uh, open registry. Open registry. And nowadays, a great uh, portion of the ships is registered in so-called open registry. Let's speak about the situation 40 years ago or 50 years ago, they are talking about flag of convenience. Mm -hmm. Then we are talking about open registry, but now this is uh, the major sort of field of ship registration. Uh, United Nations adopted 1984 the UN Convention for Ship Registration based on the UNCLOS Convention for Nationality of Vessel. Now those matter has been overcome over the years and that UN Convention will not come into force. And we understand the free trade and uh, free economy. And the people have to understand, we can, uh, you can register anywhere. But the important thing is, is, wherever you register your ships, we must ensure the global standard to be implemented. So that is the reason why IMO has been successful. We ensured wherever uh, the, wherever the ship will be registered, the same stringent standard should be applied for safety yeah. and environmental protection. And the safety level has been continuously improving, and the uh, pollution level has been continuously yeah. reducing. Yeah. So this is a significant, uh, I, I think, success story. And I think we should uh, really highlight the activities of uh, the IMO together with the shipping industry. And I think that we need to really ensure this global, uh, let's say, governance should be maintained for the future. Yeah, that's great. Um, I know you wanted to say a few things to the Copenhagen Forum in appreciation. You had mentioned that before, but before we wrap up. Well, uh, appreciation, well, I have a lot of appreciation, but uh, <laughs> before I um, come to that point, I just want to highlight another important issue, uh -huh. and the challenge okay. is uh, seafarers. Ah, yep. And if the uh, 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 volume of uh, fleet will be, let's say, doubled, and you need to double the, the number of seafarers. So this is a significant uh, challenge. Yep. I count it. 
the, if we meet the uh, target of 2030 to meet, to fully you know, provide uh, the CFRS fully qualified meeting STCW convention, you need to, at least for example, officers only, every year you need to develop 40,000 CFRS all over the world. 40,000, 40, everybody should be trained in accordance with IMO's international standard for competence. This is a significant uh, challenge. And the mo most important thing is we need to generate uh, the interest from the people and the young generation. Yeah. And I'm talking about uh, people in Europe, people in Japan, advanced nations. And I think we need to do more and more to highlight the importance of uh, shipping. And, um, this is not only the image. And I think we need to provide the real tangible benefit for those people who will go for the sea. So this is yeah. probably the biggest challenge. And I'm coming back to uh, the, my appreciation. I, of course, I appreciate very much uh, you, yourself, <laughs> no, 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 and your staff has been uh, yeah. tremendous and uh, remarkable. Uh, but uh, my thanks, first of all, uh, goes to the Danish government and the Danish uh, Ship Owners Association, uh, who kindly invited me. And, uh, and finally, uh, I enjoyed very much uh, last night in a wonderful uh, opera house, Royal Opera House. Uh, Mr. Anderson uh, has hosted. I appreciate very much uh, Mr. Anderson of uh, uh, Mask Group. Uh, this is uh, really uh, important uh, f for us. Mm -hmm. And I was really impressed uh, the gathering all the important people from all over the world, the ministers, and uh, get them all on board a small fleet and uh, navigating through uh, the small channel and aiming at arriving on the wonderful Royal Opera House and uh, ballet, dance, and wonderful dinner. And after dinner, we return back on the same route getting on board a small uh, ferry. I think this is really a, fa a fairy tale or a fantasy <laughs> in this 21st century. So I can true. tell you this cannot be done in London, it cannot be done in New York, or cannot be done in Singapore. This is only Copenhagen. Yeah. And I'm so sure... That's uh, <laughs> so true. <laughs> so, so this is my appreciation, and I'm sure we will come back again many, many times more. Well, Mr. Sekimitsu, I want to thank you very, very much for your generosity, um, for your kindness, and also for your insights, not only for the IMO, but your experience, and for us in this room. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. And now, I have, oops, all my stuff falling off. There we go. Um, I need a slide. You know, nothing comes off without people behind it. And you know that in your organizations. You have individuals who make each one of you look good or look successful, who help your business be successful. This event had, I would say, nothing more than one of the most wonderful armies behind them to make your couple of days look so seamless and so perfect. It was a combination between the Danish Maritime Forum and its group, the ValueWeb who designed the, the, the boards, the scribes who you have admired, I just want to do, it's important for me that you see what it takes to make this happen. And uh, I think we should say thank you to all of you who were part of the organizing team. And I want all of you to stand up, who are out around here in, in the sides. <laughs> and, and, for <laughs> all around.
And I have to say, they make it easy for me to stand up here and help shepherd you through that big red bus journey as we got to where we are today. So with that, I'd like to turn it back to Anne and say thank you for your very, very hard work over the past two days. Thank you. Well, Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, all good things come to an end. And so this first Danish Maritime Forum is also almost over. I'll have to thank all of you for all your efforts and hard work. You are very constant and happy to see, or we are very constant and happy to see, that so many people actually jumped in and was there to shape the discussions, find the challenges, and also give some answers to the solutions. I think your engagement and activity has shown that uh, this can be done and that we are all coming out wiser, wiser than we were yesterday. So many good ideas have surfaced during the last 30 hours. Our team will now work with the outcome of your fruitful discussions, and we will give you proper feedback on what will happen, happen going forward. I will also, before we end completely, ask you to make a note in your calendar for the next year's Maritime Forum. It will take place on October 7th and 8th, 2015. Now, in his opening remarks, our host, Mr. Lukeman, asked how many in the audience that would have retired in 2030. That was quite a lot of you, including myself. Therefore, during the next Danish Maritime Days in 2015, we intend to make a special effort to get the views of the next generation represented in these discussions by including a youth forum, since we depend on them to take over responsibility and engage in the development of the maritime industry and the world as well, sooner than we might or even might like to think. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank those who have not only been behind, but also been part of financing this event, the Danish Maritime Foundations, who have been very generous together with the Danish government in helping this become reality. And those are the A.P. Müller Foundation, Norian's Foundation, the Torm Foundation, the Hempel Foundation, the Danish Maritime Foundation, the Lauritsen Foundation, and as I said, also the Danish government. Now, I actually thought that I was the one going to, to thank the whole team behind all these efforts. Because, as you know, it's always the chairman and the CEOs and those who are, you know, in front who takes all the limelight. So I will ask you once again to give a hand not only to those you saw, but also to recognize that it was actually able for this event to get a lot of volunteers who wanted to be part of this, who wanted to come here to do a bit of work on a free basis. So please also give the volunteers a hand. So once again. <laughs> and then I would of course also like to, uh, to thank our host Chris Lukeman, whom you've seen, uh, being the one putting everything together, making sure that uh, we were on the right task at the right time. I think you've done wonders, uh, Chris, for putting this together. There you are. Thank you very much indeed, and you'll have a hand as well. So, thank you for supporting Danish Maritime Days and this forum. We uh, promise that we will do our utmost to transform all the good ideas and initiatives that come, came to life here into real actions in the real world in the time to come, of course dependent on the support from you. So ladies and gentlemen, a better way to predict the future is to invent it, and I think that's what we've been doing over the past few days. And with those words, thank you so much for joining us here in Copenhagen, and have a safe trip home. Thank you. Do, do.